We've been talking about how to be spiritually successful for the last few Sundays. And one of those elements of spiritual success is the habit of fellowship. You can't be successful by yourself. There was a young man, one of my classmates in high school. He was an awesome kicker. You know, he would practice by kicking over power lines, not kick, knocking them down. You know, he'd put a football in the middle of the street and boom, he'd kick over that power line to make sure he had the height. I was impressed. I would see him punt and he'd boom that ball everywhere, but he didn't want to join the football team. So he was never successful. He could kick well, but he was kicking for no reason. So as far as success is concerned, I was as successful a kicker as he was because neither one of us ever kicked the ball in the game. You know, there was this USA Today report that I read, and it for, for, for five years, they were following Christian celebrities. And by that I mean, these were celebrities who professed their faith publicly all the time. You know, the kind that win an Oscar and they say, I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, the kind that would point up to the sky whenever they scored a touchdown or hit a home run or something like that. You know, these were publicly professing Christians. And they found out that a large number of them were not active in their local church. 60% in fact. Now, I find that a little bit odd. Now, I know that they had all kinds of excuses. You know, not unlike the excuses your friends and neighbors might have who have a lot of religious opinions, but don't go to church. One businessman in particular that was interviewed spoke about how he had stopped attending church and had chosen another path to get to the same place because churches were inefficient and unproductive. Seems like he just didn't want to be in fellowship with people that were not like him. You know, <clears throat> there's a lot of excuses for not wanting to go to church. One of the excuses celebrities have is they would disrupt everything, right? You know, you come there and everybody would make a big deal. That's one of our presidents, I'm not going to mention any names, but his initials are RR, professed a tremendous amount of faith. But yet he never attended church because it would be a hassle and he would disrupt the church. Another president, oddly enough, his initials are JC, he taught a Sunday school class. As president of the United States, he taught a Sunday school class at, fir at the First Baptist Church of Washington, D.C., I knew one of the deacons there. It was legit. It was genuine. You know, and Kanye, uh, the most famous person most of you have never heard of. <laughs> He's a big celebrity, and he went to do some big deal over at uh, Lakewood Church. You know, that, that's the one with... Uh, yeah, oh, you've heard of him. <laughs> now, I, now, granted... Joel Olstein's church, as big as it is, is probably used to tremendous amounts of security and handling Kanye and all this stuff. So, you know, it's possible to be a celebrity and go to church. Now, I'm not endorsing Kanye or anything like that. I, don't, uh, I'm, I love him in the Lord like I would love any brother. And I don't know if he's actually going to church every Sunday now. I hope he is. Uh, but it is possible to go to church no matter who you are. Now, at the opposite end of Kanye and Lakewood. There's a lot of house churches and small churches. There are churches everywhere, folks. And not every church has to be like this. But we cannot forsake the gathering of one another. I received this book one time. It was a nice hardbound book. It had pictures of uh, different celebrities that I could invite to my church to speak. You know, celebrities like uh, Kurt Warner, and uh, John Singletary and probably some others they would come to your church and give their testimony and talk about how much Jesus had meant in their life and what an impact he had for ten thousand dollars a pop that's just pocket money Mike Singletary bless his heart also wanted first-class tickets for his whole family and for first-class accommodations I think I'd be a lot, I'd be money ahead if I just gave each of you a thousand dollars and says, Jesus love you. I would if I had it, but folks, it's not in the budget. <laughs> but uh, we 
ought not to look at these celebrities as the perfect example of Christian of Christianity I am not judging their faith whatsoever I'm sure if a church wants to have Mike Singletary in there and it's gonna make a difference then then they should pay and those churches gladly do Willow Creek would fly in uh, some of these celebrities from Australia you know these big singing people uh, I can't remember the names right now from Hillsong and stuff he would uh, because he could do that and it impacted his church he had a lot of people but the idea of church is the gathering together, the fellowship. You cannot be spiritually successful without fellowship. These celebrities aren't successful because they're Christians, they're successful because of the other thing that they did that made them famous. You know there was a well fellowship is essential for spiritual growth, for spiritual success. When the Bible talks about the church, it talks about a gathering of believers. It doesn't tell you what size, but it's talking about the gathering of believers. The word that we're looking here for fellowship that we get from the Bible is koinonia. Koinonia is one of those great Greek terms like aloha or agape. Aloha is in Greek. That mean a lot of different things. Koinonia means fellowship, the gathering together. And often, since we're Baptists, when we think of fellowship, we think of chicken and uh, seven layer salad and these things. And that's okay, that's part of fellowship, but the idea of fellowship, koinonia, is a partnership, doing things together, of sharing, of community, of if one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. That's what koinonia means. That is true fellowship, coming together in community. You see, when we have community, when we have fellowship, this koinonia, we have encouragement. It to, in our passage today, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Encourage each other to, do, to love and good deeds. You know, I, I love fireplaces. I have a fireplace, my first fireplace I've ever had. All these years I lived up north and I had to come to San Antonio to have a fireplace. So I can tell you, there's a fire in that fireplace if the temperature ever gets down below 70. I'll open the windows if I have to, but I'm going to enjoy that fireplace. Now, when it's time to go to bed, I might still have a bit of a fire burning. So what I do to make sure that, that, doesn't, that I don't burn the house down is that I spread the coals. You know, those little final pieces of wood that are there, I spread them out. And when they're not touching each other, they die. Slowly, they begin to cool off. And in the morning, I, I come down and I have some pieces of wood that, didn't, that weren't completely burned. Had I left them piled together, they would have burned to ashes. Folks, that's what it's like with us in our spiritual life. When we're together, we heat with the, the warmth of our fellowship and our spirit spurs each other on. But if we spread out, we begin to grow cold. And what's worse is that we might wind up clinging to others who don't have our faith and we be, begin to become more like them. Uh, my father used to say, Dime con quien andas y te, de, y te diré quien eres. That means tell me who you hang out with and I will tell you who you are. So I know we have hypocrites in the church, not this one of course. But I'd rather hang out with Christian hypocrites than the regular old hypocrites of the world. I hope that, doesn't, that, uh, that applause isn't a confession or anything. But. So, you know, the early church learned that quickly and they were an example of this fellowship and this faith. We read Acts chapter 2 and we read that they were all together in one faith and they shared everything and it was so just inspiring and who doesn't want to be a part of that group and so they would gather together and shared everything in common and they loved each other they would gather for public worship as well and other people would see them and so it was like two wings of a bird the large group fellowship and the small group intimate fellowship where they knew each other it wasn't easy you know I, I love to preach about Acts chapter 2 and how they all had everything in common but then we go to Acts chapter 6 
And we have a minority group saying, hey, you know, we're not, we don't have things all in common. Some people are getting more food than others. So we had problems. And then in Corinthians, we have this issue where some people were getting a lot of food and some people were going home hungry. They had this love feast. And apparently some people were getting more love than others. So that happens when we have people together. But the church continued to grow through this. They settled their problems. Paul would write letters. They would admonish one another and they would continue to grow. They worked it out. They worked it out. They didn't walk away. We didn't have enough denominations back then. So if you left your local church, there was nowhere else to go. There was one Sunday school class when I was a young Marine that I didn't quite understand until years later what was happening. You know, this is a pretty big church, a couple of hundred people. And it had a great Sunday school department that was graded and all this stuff. So there was this class for young couples. And folks, young couples, I'm talking about 17, 18, 19 year olds that joined the Marine Corps, left home, and they were away from their extended family. This is back in the day when we had telephone and we had the mail. But I don't know if you can remember just how slow that is and you had to pay long distance charges. We didn't have a cell phone, we didn't have email, we didn't have these ways. Uh, you know, Tracy FaceTimes with Carmen at least three, four times a day. You know, while she's over in Washington. And, and you know, we didn't, so you were separated from your extended family. You had no, so our family became that Sunday school class where the, this uh, older couple, you know, they were uh, old enough to be our parents they took in our babies and they helped us when our babies had problems and when a husband was away on deployment they, we took care of one another and we had these spiritual parents right there wasn't a deacon wasn't the pastor but this church and I'm sure this was repeated in every single Sunday school class where we took care of one another that's what the church is for that's why we gather together and all the time I thought Sunday school was to learn more about the Bible and it was not. It was to learn more about Jesus. Community provides encouragement, but community also provides mutual care. Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. That's what Paul wrote to the church of Gal in Galatia. S there's spiritual strength in numbers and people that care and love for one another. And I don't believe there's a better demonstration of that than Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, these, these people gather in there and they gather together in their weakness. When I went to uh, chaplain school, you know, we, we have rank in the military. And so we had these guys come in and talk to us about uh, AA. And the question was, what happens with your rank? You know, you've got officers, you've got chiefs, you've got sailors all gathered together in one place. What happens with that? And uh, the senior person in that little group that was speaking to us, he said, I'm Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. They put away all of their rank, all of their whatever they have, and they meet together in community. Folks, that's what the church is supposed to be. When we walk in here together, we're in one place regardless of rank. Regardless of rank, and I saw that some in the church. I remember that the same church I went to, I was surprised to see officers going to church with us, and, and it was weird. We were able to relate as Christians to one another, despite who was who. I, had a, I, I sang in the choir with the first sergeant right next to me, who was always making jokes. And I don't know if I had to laugh because they were funny or because he was the first sergeant. <laughs> but he, wasn't, he didn't feel that towards me. He loved me as if I was a regular human being and not just some junior Marine. The church is like that. It's community. It provides for mutual care. Uh, you know, there's a great TV show. I don't know if it's great. It just comes on at a time when I'm watching TV called Moms about uh, some alcoholics and, and how they, they're constantly taking care of one another it's providing, they're providing community for each other. And this is so powerful that, it, that we have Narcotics Anonymous, we have Gamblers Anonymous, we have Overeaters Anonymous, where groups of people take care of each other. We need to be Christians Anonymous. We need to take care of each other because life is hard. Life is hard at best 
And we're all going to have some problems. And so the fellowship of the church needs to be there to help one another. You know, there was an evangelist named John Wesley. You might have heard of him. He used to preach to, to big crowds out in the streets. He would stand up on a soapbox. There really was such a thing so that he could be above the crowd and his voice would project and he would preach to hundreds of people. He would preach the gospel. But you know, there was a lot of preachers who would do that, who were great. What he did was he would take these people that professed Jesus Christ and he would put them in little groups he called bands and classes. And these groups would gather together not to study the Bible so much, but as to account for one another. And they would ask each other questions. Did you sin this week? Are you sure? Are you really sure? And they would make sure, they, they would take care of one another and they, they would meet weekly. They would open the scripture, of course. They would gather around the scripture. Mainly, they were gathered to be together because you can just read the Bible by yourself. But the idea was a unity they have. And because of that, the Methodist Church was born. Other great evangelists, Billy Graham, uh, D.L. Moody, you know, all these great evangelists that we hear about, they did not form a whole church or denomination because they weren't gathering the people. Now, Billy Graham would say if he wanted to do, if he was starting later on in his life, so he was starting all over again, he would have gathered the people into small groups after he preached to them. But he left it up to the church to do. You know, there was a survey that was done a long, long time ago, but it was very startling. This survey was uh, done among uh, Baptist deacons and Sunday school teachers, <clears throat> other leaders of the church. And the question to them was, if you get into some sort of trouble, like you're, uh, you're hospitalized or you get laid off of your job or some, something important happens in your life like that, that disrupts your life, who do you turn to for help? And the vast majority of them said they're co-workers. And now these are people that are leaders in the church and they would turn to their co-workers, not to their Sunday school class, not to their church. The reason being is because they had a close connection with their co-workers that they did not have in their church. It ought not to be that way. And folks, I can't make you fellowship. Fellowship has to happen from the ground up. You know, on the other hand, I read about this Sunday school class where a, a man had lost his job and it was a considerable amount of money. But they had some money in the bank, but it wasn't going to be enough. So until he got another job, they needed help. What the Sunday school class decided to do is they were going to have a big garage sale and everybody was going to bring stuff they didn't need and they were going to sell it and then whatever they made off that garage sale was going to go to this couple to help bridge them over during this time so they could make sure they kept up with their mortgage. And a couple of things happened there, folks. Not only did they raise some money, not only did they showed Jesus' love, but they actually had a good time doing this together. And so out of this one tragic moment, if we can call losing your job a tragedy, which is only a tragedy if it's your job, out of this one moment of sadness, a lot of joy came out. So there is uh, encouragement in community and mutual caring. But there's also power. Jesus said, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. We talked about how prayer unleashes the power of God. Prayer in agreement, prayer in fellowship multiplies that power of God as it comes out. There's no Lone Ranger Christians. After our commitment to Christ, we need to, meet, need to make a commitment to a local body. You know, Rick Warren said that uh, you become a part of the human race when you're born. Boom, there you are, you're human. But it's not until somebody takes you home that you become part of a family. So you can be born again, but you're not part of a family unless you're part of a fellowship. 
You know, there are 58 different teachings in the New Testament that you can't do by yourself. They're called to one another's. And in your bulletin, you have a listing of some of them. Repeatedly, the faith is a one another faith. You know, I had a, a friend who would drive 40, mi 40 minutes to go to church. It was a huge mega church. It was family time. You know, they'd go there and they'd sit in a big auditorium. They'd listen to, I'm sure it was a good sermon, great music. And then after church, they'd go into the big atrium and they'd get some lunch. I'm telling you, that atrium in that church was bigger than most fast food places that you go to. And they'd get their little lunch and have their little family time and then they'd drive 40 minutes home. They'd make a day of it. She did not know anybody in that church. They didn't have any friends. If they miss a Sunday, nobody would know. They just came in and came out without ever anybody talking to them. I don't know how much church that is. I believe that I was the closest thing to a pastor that she had because she would come on Wednesday nights and, and participate locally in our Awana program. They're going to drive 40 minutes on a Wednesday night to something. She even became an Awana leader in our church. But she had no friends in her church. That's, folks, that's not church. That's culturally religious. I'll give you that. But if, she, if her husband lost her job, what Sunday school class was going to have a yard sale for her? If her child got sick, who was going to take care of her child? You know, who was going to help her with that? We need the church. We, we need the fellowship. And we need to be the fellowship because I've also heard a story about someone who was a part of a church and he was not, he did not have anybody reach out to him at a time when his wife was sick. I've told you these stories before. They're repeated all the time. Somebody in a family gets sick, the person pulls away because they have to take care of their loved one, and they lose their church. Because we don't have a, because our church did not have a system to follow up. We need fellowship. We need koinonia. We need to show our love for one another in practical, solid ways. Because this fellowship is essential. This koinonia is essential for spiritual success, for spiritual health. Every step towards spiritual maturity I've ever had in my life has involved another person. Sometimes that person was teaching me, or sometimes I was teaching that other person, but we were moving forward together. You know, when we talked about Acts chapter 2, we, it says that every day the Lord added to their numbers. And when we talk about Acts chapter 6, where we had that problem with the widows, the Hebrew and the Greek widows, after they fix that problem, it also says that the Lord added to their numbers. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that group? There was a TV show that went on for a long time about a bar. And uh, at that bar, everybody knew your name, especially if your name was Norm. <laughs> and what it showed was, was fellowship. You know, they, they knew each other, they took care of each other, they teased each other. I'm not going to say they loved one another. And the, the, a little bit later, we had a couple of more shows that were immensely popular. Friends, about a group of people living in New York City, in fabulously wealthy apartments. I don't know how they paid for that. But don't go to New York City and expect to live across from Central Park. But they, they were separated from their families. They were living in New York City and they had one another. And then Seinfeld was the same. Again in New York City, people gathering together. The church should be like that. You should be missed when you're not there. Baptist Temple is part of a family of churches and service organizations sharing a large strategic campus in San Antonio, Texas to serve the spiritual and physical needs of our community.